Of course, the remarkable economic growth in China and other emerging economies also has implications for how the world works and hence for Australia's place in the world. And we've seen how the G20 uh, and other forums have, uh, have evolved. At the regional level, we've seen APEC and the East Asian Summit and so on and so on. Australian governments, both Labour and Coalition, have played very positive roles in these processes of, of, of evolution and in these forums. And the present Prime Minister is continuing in that tra tradition just, just last week in Singapore. Now, geopolitics is not our business, but obviously for my company, things can go seriously wrong uh, and affect our business if geopolitics go wrong. It matters immensely to Australia, and it matters specifically immensely to Australia's resources industry, that Asia should work out ways to maintain stability and harmony. It seems obvious to me that um, we will need a continuing leadership role by the U.S., uh, tempered by a growing role for China as, a, as its power grows, but also a role for Japan, which remains such an important country and economy. We needn't fear the shift, but it is something that we need to consider as the nation shapes its approach to the future. And I think that generally Australians understand and accept this, on the whole, Australians are very positive about China and accept its growing power and influence. A recent Lowy Institute poll highlighted that 59% uh, of Australians trust China to act responsibly in the world, up from 47% just a year before. So after several centuries of world global affairs being dominated by the US and Europe, the next few decades will require important adjustments. Australia's history has been a long one of adaption from its European heritage to its Asian context, and that story is not over yet. Along the road there will be difficult patches, and Australia will have no choice to work through these in a patient, open-minded and tolerant way. As opposed to these global forces which I just described, and which to some extent is outside of Australia's control, even if, if we talk about how we adapt and so on, there are also some domestic challenges which will come, principally uh, on two topics that I'd like to discuss, which is labor flexibility and scale, which will impact us as we meet the demand from, from this development that I've just described. So the first one that I'd like to talk about is talent, and BHP Billiton has always uh, recognized the importance of talent. As far back as, uh, as in the 1880s, the chairman, Bill Wax Waxton, at that time, traveled to the U.S. to hire the best industry experts. My present management team composition continues to show that we value international and search globally for talent. My colleagues on my management committee are a Brazilian, a Colombian, a Scotsman, two Americans, and an Australian. Two, if, you, if, if I allow myself to be, a, to be counted. And in trying to attract and keep <clears throat> quality talent in our company and industry, challenges are emerging. We don't talk about a labor force, but a labor market, signifying that labor is mobile and, and must be utilized where it adds most value to the market overall. Australia must, in the first instance, recognize that this labor market is only going to become more global. Just two years ago, there was a massive gap in talent in the resources industry. My view is that this gap is going to return, and we need to, know, uh, we need to ensure that um, we have uh, the, the right labor used in the right way. And the two most obvious levers is to increase the number of people with the relevant skills or to be better allocate those relevant skills. But in reality, we're going to have to do both of these things. Apart from labor, the increasing demand and the sheer scale that I've just spoken about will also give us some challenges as we talk about our scale to retain our seat at the global resources table. In the last resources boom, which basically was the post-war reindustrialization between 1950 and 1970, 
the market capitalization, which is a, a, a measure of demand, of the top five mining companies increased threefold in real terms. But three of the top ten mining companies dropped quite dramatically in ranking, largely because they weren't able to scale up as the demand uh, uh, manifested itself. As this demand that I've, uh, I've shown you uh, will come, only the largest companies will have the skills base and financial strength to develop assets to their fullest potential and scale. Um, over recent years, Australia has lost some market share in our core resources markets. If indeed we are going to enter into a long-term higher demand scenario, somebody will fill that demand, and I'll talk about the market in just a minute. I've shown how beneficial it is for a country to participate in lead growth. And if that happens, with this demand, Australian companies will need to continue to build scale of operations within Australia, which naturally be brings us to a discussion on funding of expansion. <clears throat> In the first instance, I would like to start off by endorsing some of the points that my chairman, Don Argus, recently made in public. In order to build scale, we are going to consider, have to con consider how we fund the next wave of resource-intensive infrastructure. Currently, there are some 74 projects worth $80 billion in an advanced stage of planning. FDI is always sensitive, and those sensitivities increase when investors have close connections with foreign governments. Um, but to my mind, the FDI, FDI debate in Australia often misses the critical investment issue. Capital sources to fund resource projects are limited, primarily due to a mismatch between risk appetite of funding and the inherent riskiness of projects themselves. Let me illustrate. Australian banks are, la are sometimes hesitant to take on the lead role in syndicating loans for very large projects because they fear that syn the syndication market may leave them overexposed, a very genuine concern given the recent market conditions. Foreign markets have therefore been called upon, and over the last uh, five years, five of the seven syndicated loans, more than $3 billion to Australian corporates, had a foreign bank as lead arranger. Other than a mismatch of risk, there are also some structural challenges to our economy. The Australian bond market has always been stunted. Now, existing shareholders have been uh, uh, very good in giving equity, uh, particularly in this downturn. And while this is very effective as a tactical source of funds, it's, n it's not a long-term solution. We have an absence of a bond market. And additionally, um, while not clearly not simple, a part of the solution has to lie in continued foreign direct investment, meaning that both Australia and Australian companies are going to need to be open to this kind of investment, despite its immediate and strategic implications. Next, fiscal and ownership stability, particularly in our industry, is very critical for investment. Let me explain. Resource-related infrastructure investments are typically measured, as I said, in billions of dollars. Development take, developments take many, many years to complete, and it can take many decades before returns on investments are realized. And the developments are risky. Given all of these uncertainties, longer-term fiscal and ownership stability is a critical precondition for investment. I've already mentioned how it's not down to good fortune and good geography only that we've become um, the lead supplier or the supplier of choice for raw materials. We've also had a stable political environment, and this stability has additionally given the, uh, the certainty needed for these risky investments that I speak about. Again, all of these things are not things that we should take for granted. History shows us that policies that threaten this stability can have significant long-term impacts. Perhaps an example, at the risk of offending some of the people in the room, a cross-Tasman example. While Australia and New Zealand enjoyed 
pretty much the same level of income for most of the 20th century. Australians are now a third richer than, than New Zealanders. There are many possible explanations, but there's no doubt that increased government interference coupled with fewer policies to support growth has played a role. In a world where capital is increasingly mobile, Australia must continue to make itself attractive to attract investment or risk losing those investment dollars to other countries. Which brings us to the final challenge that I'd like to discuss, the role of markets in our business. Since the 1970s, broad consensus has emerged that commercial market mechanisms are the best way to govern economic relationships between parties, that the allocation of resources between consumers and producers can be most efficiently, effectively, and peacefully be determined by the market. Now is a critical time for all stakeholders to reaffirm an, a commitment to an open global resources markets. And despite concerns and attempts by some nations to secure access to resources, it's important that to acknowledge that the risk of supply security at best are slight. Markets in resources have functioned well in this extraordinary period of expansion. They've held together without government support through one of the sharpest economic downturns in history. Throughout both of these periods, in good and bad, those that have been prepared to pay the market price have been able to get supply. The world's mining industry can meet the demand for fuels and ores over coming decades. It can manage risks by appropriate investment. And companies like BHP Billiton has deep commitments to delivering the resources for which we are contracted. Again, a lesson from history. The history of Japan's economic rise provides a useful lesson. At its time, it had concerns about resources security. In time and on the basis of experience, Japan came to trust markets to deliver the raw materials that it needs. For those countries now industrializing, the best answer to the question of resource security is to be found in trusting the hand of the market to deliver them. Some of you will no doubt have some detailed knowledge about the annual uh, iron ore price negotiations and all of the media attention that it attracts. For other exchange-traded uh, commodities like oil and copper and so on, it's a very different story. The reason the prices of most of our products attack so uh, attract so little scrutiny is because the price-setting mechanism is transparent, it's accessible to multiple parties, and it truly reflects global supply and demand. When commodities are traded in the latter way, you also see a rational investment and allocation of capital to meet that demand. And it ensures long-term supply security for customers. In these ways, markets can be enormously important tools to, uh, to decrease anxieties over security of supply. The logic and mutual benefits of trade between suppliers and customers will prevail as long as we are committed to open, free trade principles governed by market pricing. Put simply, markets are the best way to allocate investments and resources in our business. Market mechanisms will ensure that developing nations' raw materials needs are met and suppliers ob obtain sufficient investment to meet the demand, discover and develop new deposits. So in conclusion, let me try and draw together a number of themes. Australia has done remarkably well from resources exports over the past few decades and especially over the past few years. The average person in the street probably doesn't realize how important this has been. We can all hope that Australia will keep on doing as well in the future and it certainly has the opportunity of doing so. Whether we do depends on two big questions. Obviously, in the first instance, will resources demand continue to grow as strongly as we expect? And, and I certainly expect that it will. And will Australia and companies like BHP Billiton with deep roots here
continue to meet that demand and get its fair share of that growth? Again, I strongly believe the answer is yes, but we shouldn't take it for granted. On the demand side, we've spoken about the challenges that face our customers as they transform and grow and the uh, inevitable changes that we will have to go through. On the supply side, we will have to work hard to hold and expand our place in the market. We have to stay ahead of our competitors. What has given us the edge? Not only our natural endowment, which is massive ore bodies close to the sea and close to the customers. It's also taken adequate capital, a fiscally stable environment, world-class technology and management skills, political stability, a supportive regulatory environment, acceptable labor cost, and adequate infrastructure. We must continue to get these things right. The opportunity is enormous. Our resources opportunity provides, uh, sorry, our resources endowment provides great opportunities available to few other countries. That endowment, however, also comes with an obligation to develop them to continue to support growth. Maximizing these opportunities matter greatly to Australia, matter greatly to all of those individuals that are trying to get a better life. Much rides on how well we build on the opportunities that we have. On the one hand, it's exciting. On the other hand, it's sobering. Thank you very much. Marius, thanks so much for, for a fascinating presentation. I think we've got about uh, 15 minutes for some, for some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Uh, there are some roving microphones uh, at the back of the room, and please wait till the microphone uh, reaches you. So, Mr. Klopp, there's one issue that's been around in Australia for 20 odd years is our capacity to understand and use foreign languages, particularly Asian languages. Can you tell us? Do you know? Do you know offhand how many BHP staff speak Chinese, for example? Gosh, that would be a very difficult uh, decision, uh, sorry, a piece of information, but I can tell you that all of the staff that deal with, uh, with our Chinese customers deal with them in their first language. So, uh, so, you, so it's, it's, it's native speakers who are basically doing Native it. speakers or people that have, that have studied and lived in China for long enough to be, uh, you know, if somebody can joke in a language, I always say they're a native speaker. Yeah. Certainly while our lead negotiators are not... Chinese, sometimes not Chinese, they can, they can joke in Chinese. Yes, but as there's a, I think there's a recent case in Shanghai demonstrates native speakers can also encounter difficulties in dealings with China. And uh, does, the, does the company train people to learn Chinese? Are you interested in doing that? Or? Well, um, I, I think the, the company obviously provides resources to train many languages, not, not only Chinese. No, no. For us, Spanish, for example, is equally, uh, equally important as, a, as an operating language. Uh, if I look at the, um, how people move through our company, most of our executives would have worked in uh, two or three continents, and invariably <clears throat> you end up in a non-English speaking environment. My own career is no, no different from that. So um, you know, this is a very, <clears throat> sorry, from a people perspective, a very multicultural place that, 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 that I work at. Thank you. Dr. Kloppers, thank you for a very enlightening speech tonight. Uh, Yasser Alain sorry, Head of Tax Policy for the Institute of Chartered Accountants. I, I, I did notice that you touched very lightly on an issue uh, in, your, in your speech about uh, the resources sector contribution back to the community via the tax system in terms <coughs> of tax revenues. And I'm just really, really intrigued uh, with you here tonight to ask the question around um, whether you see uh, moves that appear to be afoot within uh, Dr Henry's wide-sweeping tax review to, uh, to potentially move towards a, uh, a greater tax burden being placed on the resources sector um, as a reflection of a, a, a higher level of return for the community's collective assets um, as being a, a potential challenge for the, <coughs> for the next few years as well. Um, you know, sorry, I've just got a frog in my throat, which is not a good time. <coughs> 
I think that um, obviously very difficult for me to speculate on something which I, which I haven't seen, but I think I was at some pains tonight to point out that a package of things determine whether we will get investment and continue to get investment and grow in scale and size. The front-loaded nature of the resources investment, not only in mining but also in oil and gas, means that we place an extraordinary premium on fiscal stability, which means that you know, not changing the rules halfway down the road is very important. We, we absolutely, as an industry, uh, can make evaluations when, uh, when making a new investment uh, on, on whatever level of, uh, of, of, of contribution of whatever kind there is. But I think what is very important for us as an industry around the world is that for something that you put most of the money in the ground on a 40-year life, that you know that the ownership and the, uh, and the tax conditions that you signed up to is, is going to be stable. That's, that's unlike almost any other industry that, that I know. Thank you very much. I noticed, uh, even in the press today, that you're heavily involved in shipping your ore to the sea. Is there an argument here that we ought to be looking at uh, in expanding our Australian shipping fleet so we make the money right to the end line? It's uh, a little difficult for me to comment on, on Australia's perspective uh, in, in, uh, in building ships and so on. What I can tell you as a company is that we look at shipping as a globally very, very efficient business with very efficient funding models. And traditionally, uh, we have not seen how we can create value by investing in ships. And so we are, where we are probably the world's largest shipper, if not the number one, then you know, number two or so, uh, all of that has been, been, been carried by, by contracting ships. And uh, you know, we, you know, that's, that's basically my only experience of the shipping industry. I just want to ask you, uh, I suspect that some of your counterparts in China probably don't share your enthusiasm with markets as their most efficient and, uh, and effective place for price discovery and resource allocation. And uh, the second is uh, you, you mentioned in passing the issue of the environmental impact of the industrialization that China foresees as part of what drives the demand for the resources. Now, clearly, that's, we feel like both of those forces are going to be some constraint on the growth story that you outlined. How do you see those two, if you like, those two adversarial forces coming into the equation? Yeah, it's um, you know, the second one is a little bit more difficult for me to answer because um, you know, countries will have to take very, very determined decisions as they industrialise and get that balance between what energy choices they make and so on. And, and, and obviously, China is going to have to make huge choices, but the world is also going to have to make huge choices as it contends with carbon emissions from China and India being added to the OECD. But I, I probably can't add any, any useful discussion on that. But let me come back to your, your first question about markets. The main thrust of my argument this evening on markets is that we are going to need massive investment to, to provide massive amounts of, uh, of, of resource and that the world will supply that, and Australia will supply that massive amount of resource if the correct signals um, are given to capital. And there's no more efficient way of giving those signals than, than markets. Now, incidentally, as just as I, as I reflect on the one example that I did note here tonight, which is the iron ore market, it's very interesting to note <clears throat> that just over the last year, perhaps, this, uh, China is obviously a huge steel producer, but that the steel market, a uh, traded steel market, has really taken off in China, which means that people are expressing a wish that steel market prices f be formed on supply demand. And Chinese parties are expressing that wish that says, look, let's, let's, let's just form these steel prices in the market. Huge trading volumes. Once the steel price... Um, trades on a market price. My experience of things like energy markets and liberalization and other sectors is that the inputs then become traded as well. So I think we, we actually on a path here that is, that is very aligned with where, where I hope we will, we will end up one day. We have time for one last question. Uh, right at the back there. <clears throat> 
thank you, Dr. Kloppers. Uh, you've, you've mentioned a lot about uh, China this evening, but uh, much less so on the, uh, the other country, uh, India. Uh, is that reflecting where uh, BHP's markets lie now, or, uh, or is there something uh, special about India that makes it uh, very much different in yeah. the uh, near future than China? I'm a little worried about this Dr. Kloppers thing, because I think only my mum uses it when she wants to feel proud of me. But, um, <laughs> so, um, but um, talk, we've actually just completed a large piece of work in, uh, in India, and while one of the challenges that India has got is that its ability to migrate people to, to centers, uh, to cities, uh, is a little bit more constrained, given, given the uh, society, given uh, needs, wants, and desires. So we, we don't see the same number of cities forming, and we don't see the same amount of high-rise buildings and so on. Nevertheless, we do believe that India is on a, on a, on a secular growth path, uh, you know that it's come through this uh, international turmoil, being a more closed economy extremely well. It's continued to grow. And we do uh, see India, particularly for the energy products and for coking coal, uh, when we talk about Australian resources, as a, as a very, very large market in the future. Perhaps not quite approaching China, but certainly uh, you know, larger than any other individual country market that we've got. Okay, um, I might bring proceedings to a close there. I think if anyone uh, in the audience doubted that resources were going to be a big part of this country's future in the world, I think you've done a great job of dispelling those doubts. I, just my experience of spending a bit of time in, in China and India last week uh, seems to suggest to me that the way that other countries see us will be increasingly determined by our resource sector particularly these emerging giants, and that poses real challenges for this, for this country. One of the things that I, I think uh, is important to note is that one wonders just how much our government um, factors in Australia's resource sector and its exports into our general strategic thinking and our general international relations. And it's for that reason that, uh, that the Lowy Institute is going to be doing more and more work on the international relations of resources and resources trade. Um, on behalf of the Lowy Institute, I would like to thank you, Marius, for coming along and giving such a fantastic speech tonight. I'd also like to thank you sincerely for being such a wonderful corporate supporter of the Lowy Institute, uh, BHP Billiton. And, uh, on behalf of the audience, to thank you for such an informative and entertaining presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, could you join me in thanking Marius Kloppers? Thank you.